have these treats, gentlemen, so if you are hungry during the time uh, we're up here, I, I, I'm not quite sure what the significance Can I just point out something? Okay, please do. All right. <clears throat> Each of us was asked our treats, plain cookie, cookie, cream cheese filled brownie. <laughs> All I right. Wanna, I want to point out that I, I have shrunk, <laughs> shrunk my cookies much smaller than the size of the uh, representative. <laughs> and I want to point out rightly so. <laughs> Maybe you need that tapeworm. I don't, I'm not sure. And I want to know why uh, David there uh, gets, can get himself a Diet Coke and we're uh, stuck with water. <laughs> but you guys probably don't need a, the caffeine at this point. That's a private so. sector advantage. We can get here. you a Diet Coke. No, I know, no. I'm not just kidding. All right, okay. Well, so great to have each and every one of you. Hope that you had a restful night here in Duluth. A little bit of rain. You know, that happens so seldom in Duluth, at least, wow. Every, every like, third day, we have a hundred-year rain. It just comes gushing down the hill, so it's been it, it a wet summer. It didn't snow, Andy. It didn't snow, but you that's... Had a, you had a breeze yesterday <laughs> afternoon. My terrific running mate, Luthien Yvonne Brenner solon says the Coast Guard measured the, the third highest waves in the recorded history, so it was breezy on the park there. Yeah, it was, it was. Well, let's, let's talk about um, some of the questions that we started bringing up, and then we'll go to audience questions in a bit. But what is the role of government in, pri in developing private sector jobs? Who wants to take a stab at that first? Well, I'd say it's a partnership. Okay. And, uh, you know, I drive up here uh, and go by the paper company in New Page. And that company began in uh, 1985 with the uh, support of the uh, state government and the city of Duluth and Governor Perpich and uh, others, including his excellent uh, PCA commissioner, then Sandra Garbring, and this is an example of how government, good government works effectively, got assisted the company in, in sound economic development. Uh, the company where Representative Emmer was, was yesterday and issued his jobs plan was a recipient of TANF uh, uh, job fund training funding and, and placement funding. So there is, a, I believe, a constructive role for government to play in cooperation with the private sector where most job creation does occur, but in supporting the, those endeavors. Well, and I, I think, uh, you know, the sad fact is today, Senator, you can't drive on a road without having some federal funding. You can't go into any business without having some federal or state funding. As far as the future uh, and sustainability, affordability, being able to pay for the things that we expect out of government, when it comes to its role in the private sector, you'll hear politicians say always, you know, it's a partnership between governor and business, or we need to invest. You know, I, I, I've never seen government invest our money better than we can, better than the entrepreneurs, the real risk takers uh, can do. Government's role is literally to get out of the way and allow those uh, entrepreneurs to, to realize their full potential. If there is a role, it's in the marketplace, making sure that there isn't somebody taking advantage of somebody else. But aside from that, let's allow the great mm -hmm. entrepreneurs in the state of Minnesota. You talked about a great example, the uh, polymed issue. I mean, you're going to see the same thing up here with Duluth Metals. Uh, since 2000, what is it, July 2009, this region has lost 5,500 jobs. Uh, it is time that government realize more government is actually uh, suppressing the entrepreneurial spirit, that we need to pull government back, make it efficient so that people who want to create opportunities in northern Minnesota, mining opportunities, logging opportunities, so that they can actually start to exercise their own risk taking, their own investment, and start to create jobs. Well, as one who has actually started and run a small business, who has had to sign the front of a paycheck, not just the back of a paycheck, let me tell you a little bit about <laughs> running a business where I didn't take any government assistance. You can do it without government, but you can't do it in spite of government. I mean, we do need a strong public sector, a responsible public sector, that creates a level playing field, that has tax policies that allow small businesses like mine, like many of those up here, to invest, to, to, to help create jobs. But I also need, and, and I think most businesses would agree with this, we need a strong talent pool. In the end, that's Minnesota's distinctive advantage. We need the kind of talent that allows us to compete. We need to make some smart public sector investments. I mean, look at the great um, biomedical diversity sector growing up on the, the university campus came through bonding. That's going to create a, a, an entirely new industry. And what's exciting is that right next to this campus of four buildings is a campus of private sector companies, including some venture capitalists. 
ready to take those good ideas, commercialize them, bring them to the, the private sector. Talking a little bit ago about the opportunity to, to bring a wind turbine plant to northeastern Minnesota. One of the things that is needed is the heavy load Highway 2 to, to carry those. You know, fortunately, we've made that investment here, but there are other places around the state where we haven't invested in, in those 10-ton roads. And when you look at what farmers are going to produce this year, the harvest that they're going to have, we need that kind of infrastructure. So it is a partnership, but it's a partnership based on smart thinking, based on what's best for Minnesota, based on truly understanding what is our distinctive advantage as a state. You know, Andy, I think it's fortunate and overdue that we're having our first uh, now of our seventh debates here in greater Minnesota. And in greater Minnesota, I think people understand that there is a very important role for government to play in, in jobs. And of course, uh, the mining industry in northeastern Minnesota is continuing today because a professor at the University of Minnesota discovered the process to, to create taconite. Uh, the government up there has pl played a very important role through the IRRRB. Uh, as Mr. Horner just said, uh, properly so, I mean, uh, highways uh, are crucial to getting people to work and getting the products to markets and the deterioration of our highways. And uh, Representative Member, I, I wish we had more federal money for highway development. I wish we had more state money. The failure of our, uh, just to keep pace with the, the needs of our growing population and the demands of business are such that we are constricting economic development in, all over the state uh, with the deterioration of our highways and, and the increased congestion with an aging population in northeastern Minnesota. More and more people need uh, p public uh, support for health care, and the, the, the hospitals in Duluth were ravaged by the failure of the GMC compromise. They lost about $19 million, and the early buy-in to Medicaid, which you oppose, would mean an initial $26 billion for hospitals here in Duluth. So there is an important role for government, and, and you, you don't believe in that, and, and I believe there is a constructive role for government to play. Well, you know, Senator, i got to tell you, you're talking about uh, a system that is actually collapsing in on itself. You know, if, if you want to solve these problems, you've got to create good paying jobs in northern Minnesota. You don't do that by having a regulatory system that delays new opportunities in, in the richest mining discovery in the world. You don't do it by forcing them to go through hoop after hoop. We, we all want clean air and water, and Minnesotans care about their natural resources, but we also need to, to use those resources efficiently and create the opportunities that they provide for our families, the hard me working men and women in this state. And you talk about needing more government. Well, PolyMet, they've invested 20 million over the first five years trying to achieve, uh, and they have successfully, as I understand it, met every threshold, and you're suggesting they should, another two years would be fine. Seven years to bring jobs to northern Minnesota is unacceptable. You want to solve the problems that you're talking about. You want people to have access to the best health care in the world. Give them a good job. Give them the opportunity to realize the quality of life that this state offers. More government right now is not the answer. Is there a place for government? Absolutely. But we are seeing right now, we are at a crossroads where government is literally choking the ability of people in the private economic sector to grow new jobs. I remember the days when I was younger in the 70s, the 60s and the 70s, when busloads of kids were coming from northern Minnesota all to, to all the state tournaments uh, in St. Paul and wherever else. We have to have northern Minnesota growing again. The aging population is the result of no new jobs being created in northern Minnesota. We need northern Minnesota to realize its full potential, not just the natural resources, but the opportunity for economic development that it provides. And let's loosen these people up so they can start to create the quality of life that we all remember that was northern Minnesota. Let's start growing northern Minnesota you, you again. Know because we discussed I, I have a we question, agree, actually. We, we, we agree on polymed, the, the delays of uh, regulation regulatory process has been unacceptable so how, and needs to be shortened. And that's why uh, I have my state senator running mate, uh, John Pretner Solon, working on reducing the regulatory process. I don't know because we haven't gotten in there, but I would point out Would you that, guarantee that these your, folks your, six is, months? It's your call. I couldn't guarantee anything. Can what about Duluth six Metals? Months? What, what about I, I, Duluth we Metals? We absolutely need to go through that process as well. Those are very important jobs. I couldn't agree with you more. But it's actually, you know, your friend, uh, Governor Plenty, who has been running the state regulatory agencies for the last eight years. So if you want to talk about 
delays and the failure of state agencies to be responsive, well, I think you got to point the finger right at your own yeah. uh, party. And, and that's, you know, I get to respond to that because that's, while that's fair that Governor Pauleni's been in the office, I'm not Governor Pauleni. Uh, I'm not going to agree with everything Governor Pauleni's done. We're running on different things. And I will tell you, uh, you know, Governor Pauleni's done, Pauleni has done some good things as well. And I, I, he's a good man, regardless of whether you disagree with him or agree with him. And, and Senator Dayton, if you want to come over to my house after and kick my dog, you can do that too. Okay. So, well, wait a second. Wait so, a so, let, me just, let me just make one quick comment. Is that a campaign let, promise? Let, because uh, David, let me just make one ahead. quick comment. I, I, I mean, he, here is the problem. If you think that Minnesota is going to move forward, if you think that PolyMet is going to open up in the next four years, if UMD is going to have a strong uh, opportunity, an opportunity to create strong curricula for these new jobs, if you think the Duluth K-12 schools are going to grow, if we have a continuation of this gridlock, I disagree. I mean, how do you change, how do you change it? I think you change it by saying, look, Representative Emmer has some good ideas. Senator Dayton has some good ideas. Right now, we have an environment in which Democrats and Republicans can't even come to the same table and look each other in the eye. I mean, that's the reality. How do you move forward when you have one side that says we're going to do everything through spending cuts? I mean, Representative Emmer introduced his, his business tax plan yesterday. It's a great plan. Congratulations. It's the plan that was introduced by Governor Pawlenty's commission that I embraced 18 months ago. And at the time it came out, Republicans said, oh, we can't do that. Nope, we're not going to do that. Wouldn't even discuss it. Wouldn't even put it on the table. Representative Emmer's own Republican caucus, dead on arrival. Senator Dayton's Democrats, same thing, dead on arrival. We had the plan. We didn't have to wait for 18 months. We could have been making these investments. You have to have leadership that says we need to move forward. It is not about fighting over who's right. It's about fighting over what's right. And what's right is what's going to grow Minnesota's economy. I want my question. I have the solution if you'll allow me. Because first off, uh, with all due respect, you're wrong. Democrats and Republicans do get along. They sit down at the table. They have a different point. <laughs> hey, I, I, I disagree. I've been there. You've got great people from northern Minnesota that we work with every day. Do we see the world through the same eyes? No. But that's what makes the system so wonderful. You're not supposed to all agree. You're supposed to shake hands when it's over and move on to the next issue. You want to solve this problem, by the way. Uh, and you might come down, Tom, because the plan that I put out yesterday is not the plan that you're talking about. In fact, yours mirrors the plan that Governor Pawlenty put out. Ours is a little bit different, and I think ours will create jobs all over the state of Minnesota. You want to solve this problem, there's a bill that if I'm in the office, we will move to get passed immediately. It's called First Things First. When you go down to the legislature right now, the governor has one tool. It's called unallotment. It's not right. We need to give the governor a different tool, the opportunity to declare a fiscal emergency which is simply defined as your revenues will not meet your expenses. Once the governor de uh, declares a fiscal emergency if this bill were law, the legislature has 45 days to put a balanced budget on the table. Imagine a world, because right now the way it works is in 2011 the governor will come in and up by constitution will have to put a budget proposal out by the end of uh, January, early February. And then what usually happens is the legislature screws around till the last night of the session uh, arguing about everything but the budget. This would allow the governor to declare a fiscal emergency on day one of the session and now imagine a world where the governor's got a budget out by the end of January, early February. The legislature has its cards on the table by mid-February, late February. Now you can take those issues that you agree on and get them off the table and we can all focus on those things in the budget that we disagree on. Reach agreement, we'll have two plus months to do it. That's the way you solve the problem. There is a difference in our plan. There, there is a difference in our plans. I'm willing to be honest and pay for my tax cuts to make investments in the budget, to lay out a specific budget that says, if you're going to cut six, seven hundred million dollars with a six billion dollar deficit, you have to pay for it or it isn't going to get done. Chuck. You, you're sitting there, you have a barrel full of ink and you're not saying anything. <laughs> you know, no, nobody argues with the need to grow the economy in northern Minnesota or across Minnesota and of course, no one is arguing about the need to, to maintain, uh, as you called it, uh, our talent pool, Minnesota's talent pool. 
But with, under the current economic climate, how do we pay for education? How do we maintain that talent pool? And, and, and Mr. Emery, you, you talked very, you know, about your budget approach, your budget schedule. Would that work? What do you guys think of that? I know that's like three questions, but <laughs> I, I'm not sure if I'm going to get in again, so I want to get all of them. <laughs> Oh, sir, Senator Dayton. Well, let's be clear, as uh, Mr. Warner correctly pointed out, but Representative Emmer has no budget. You know, it was, it was Republican Governor Arnie Carlson who taught me, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. And so, you know, there is no budget uh, in that proposal. There's some good ideas, I would agree, Representative Emmer, in terms of stimulating job creation. But the reality is we're looking at a, a deficit of uh, almost $6 billion. That doesn't even factor in inflation. And uh, Mr. Horner and I have both put forward proposals. We put them up, people can disagree with different parts. There's no popular way to solve a $6 billion budget deficit. How, how but know? yesterday, let me just, you, okay. you just added, Representative Ember, uh, over $600 million to that deficit. And, and that, you know, so now, now we're waiting still for the hard part. You know, we're, we're uh, eight weeks from today is the election. Next week, uh, early voting begins in Minnesota, and you won't tell people, you just refuse to tell people where you're gonna cut. Now it's six and a half billion dollars to balance the budget. My proposal is that I would make the richest Minnesotans pay their fair share of taxes. You know, under Governor Carlson in 1994, the, the, the tax distribution, state and local taxes, was about even in Minnesota as a percent of income. Now, the richest people in Minnesota pay, uh, which is 10%, only 80% of what the rest of Minnesotans pay in state and local taxes, and the richest 1%, this is according to the Minnesota Department of Revenue, pay only two-thirds as a percent of their income in state and local taxes compared to everyone else. I just don't think that's fair. And I think if we go back to what uh, Governor Carlson's distribution was, which was even, and even the, just to the same percentage of their income that the richest Minnesotans are being asked to pay, that would generate the revenues, that goes to your point, Chuck, of investing in education, which has been cut back drastically in real dollars per pupil under uh, Governor Pawlenty. So, you know, we have a choice here. Are we going to make taxes fair or are we going to keep them unfair? Are we going to raise revenues to be able to invest in education, which I believe is key to the future, key to job creation, key to well-educated people, healthy people, or are we going to let our, let our schools continue to deteriorate? Are we going to allow the tuition at the University of Minnesota Duluth to continue to rise so that working men and women cannot send their own children to our own public colleges and universities? Those are the, the key choices that we face in this budget, which is about values and priorities every bit as much as it is about dollars and cents. Senator, $626 million in tax incentives to cure the job deficit that we have in this state is a solution. And if you take a look at it, mine I've actually gone to the Department of Revenue and said, will you run these numbers? Folks, only in government can politicians tell you that an increase is a decrease. I don't know where you get the budget deficit when we're going to have $2.8 billion roughly more to spend. The next governor and the next legislature will have, based on current revenue projections, almost $2.8 billion more to spend. The only way that you can call that a deficit today is if you want to spend more than you have, if you want to spend beyond your means. Because government in this state is going to have $3 billion more to spend. These guys want to spend $38 billion. What's, what family in this state would not die to have a 7 to 8% raise next year? Government can't live with a 7 to 8% raise. It's got to have a 17% raise. It's time we start talking about facts. And the numbers I put out yesterday, they don't add to the deficit unless you want to buy into this accounting that when these folks give the government their tax money and, and the government says no we're going to let you keep some of that money so you can create opportunities that somehow that adds to the deficit by telling taxpayers you get to keep more of your money to create more jobs I challenge both of you by the way your your plan which is about two pages long has a paragraph in it that essentially says my campaign does not have the computer modeling capabilities to prove to you that this works but here's what I propose to do I'm going to propose that both of you go to the Department of Revenue that does have have the computer modeling capabilities. Take these so-called plans, you call yours an outline, take your so-called plans to the Department of Revenue and have them run your numbers and show these people that they do in fact work. They don't. Well, yours, yours will kill every mom and pop business in this state and drive more business out of
of town. You've admitted even in your own plan that you're $700 million short of whatever solution is you're looking for. Well, that's $6 billion and, dollars ahead of yours. And, and, <laughs> well, well, wait a second, no, actually, wait a second. Let me just mind, say we'll, to, to, we'll create more revenue. I think we're getting a little rhetoric let, heavy Let me here. just say to, to, to Representative Emmer, I mean, if this is a family budget, you've got two parents that aren't even talking to each other. <laughs> I mean, come on. We have a deficit, not because we're spending more than the revenue that's coming in, but because you already spent the money. I mean, we have a deficit because last year, when you were in the legislature, when your party passed budgets with Governor Pawlenty, you spent $4 billion more than we have. You did it by taking money from the school districts, you did it by taking federal money, and now you're doing it by taking money from small businesses to say, you have to accelerate your sales tax payments. We don't have $2 billion extra, you know that. You already spent it, you spent it twice over. Now we're just trying to dig out of the hole. And so the reality is that you have to have a responsible budget. And I will say to, to my good friend, Senator Dayton, that it's great that you're up here talking about how we need to really hold MPCA's feet to the fire, when in every other part of the state you've been saying, oh, it's the Minnesota Pollution Cooperation Agency, and we're going to be stricter on, on environmental review. We ought to be tough on environmental review, but we ought to have a process that says to government, here's a good project, let's figure out how to make it work, let's figure out how to make it work in an environmentally responsible way. The answer to today's challenges is not to say, here's the status quo, let's raise all kinds of new taxes and make that status quo bigger, but neither is it to say, we'll take the status quo and we'll shrink it down to nothing. Because for so many Minnesotans, Minnesotans who are playing by the rules, Minnesotans who have invested in the future in PolyMet, who want a good education in K-12, at UMD, at St. Scholastica, who want to be able to go to the great hospitals in, in the Duluth area and get good care, Durbin Keeney, who on the, the, the Veterans Council, who wants to know that, that when they get to the end of the year, unlike this year, they're not going to be able, they're not running out of money simply to transport veterans to, to the care facilities. I mean, how appalling is that? For a lot of Minnesotans, the status quo isn't working. You gotta change the status quo. You have to take a new approach to government. You have to take a new approach to cooperation to figuring out where the answers are, how we get things done, how we move the state forward. So you guys, you guys won't take your plans for the Department of Revenue? I did. I, I, I mean, well, my plan is right there. My you, plan is right you, there. Have, will you guys agree to have the Department of Revenue so these people understand that your plan will tax haircuts, will tax garage sales, oh, we're will not tax gonna, grandma's on. walker? Oh, come will, will you, on. Will you guys no, agree? First of all, will you guys agree? Well, you guys agree, just commit today, that you'll take your plan just like we took ours, take it to the people that have the computer modeling capabilities, and show everybody, if you're so convinced it works, show them. Take it to the Department of Revenue just the way we did and have them run the numbers and, and say yes I'll make, I'll make, I'll make, I'll make, I'll make, I'll make, I'll make a deal with you, Representative Emmer. I will do that if you will tell us by the end of the week uh, when you, where, where you're going to cut $6 billion in spending to balance the budget. Is that a deal? Listen, I, right, first good. off. All right. By Friday. <laughs> by Friday. Good. All right. Yeah, and, I, yeah, and, I, and I have sent mine to the Department of Revenue, yeah. and I will ask them to have it ready by Friday. First so off, we'll have Senator, Friday this is the problem with running for office for 28 years and doing it the same way we've you, been you doing it every year. More often than I have. Every year at this level, in a statewide <laughs> level, you have bought into this thing where government needs more money to spend even when it doesn't right, have it. So show us where you're going to cut it. Just tell us where you're going to cut it. No, no, no. No more talking. No more talking. <laughs> Take a breath, because I'm going to ask a question that goes back to my first question. We talk about the partnership between business and government. We're all business people here for the most part. What three things do you propose to make government side of the equation better? What can government actually do? Three things can government actually do to make it easier for a small business, easier for a big business to, do, to, to grow in Minnesota? What three things? Sans rhetoric, three things. All right. First, let me just say, you know, Representative Emmer and I, a couple, our, no, our, 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 our couple of old hockey players. So we, I, hey, we you're don't, old. We don't mind. Oh, okay, he's a young hockey player. I'm you were a, a goalie too. Player. That's different. So we don't mind, you know, a couple elbows. I actually knew three how things. to skate. Three things. Three things. Three things. One, one is streamlined regulations. 
And, and my uh, running mate, Yvonne Predner Solon, is working to reduce the regulations. <laughs> we can have strict environmental protection and efficient reviews in a timely fashion. We should re re eliminate the duplication, triplication of reporting requirements that businesses and nonprofits and individuals and local governments all are overburdened by. So that's number one. Number two is we should reduce property taxes. You know, property taxes have increased by over $3 billion because, again, taxes have become more aggressive in Minnesota. And third, I, I think Representative Emmer has some good ideas about the, the uh, S Corporation, the 10% there. Elim eliminate immediately the, the uh, sales tax on capital equipment expenditures and extending that to services that are making capital expen expenditures. Because uh, unfortunately, the, the initiative that the governor and the legislature have taken to provide a rebate has been stalled because uh, the state doesn't have no enough money to pay its bills and the, off the Department of Management budget is now delaying those refunds and that's defeating the purpose of, of the initiative. Well, we're hoping they forget about it. The government hopes they forget about that. That rebate is well, well, it's just delaying the money payments to the schools, delaying payments to the university, delaying right. the payments okay. to small business makes them borrow more money. It's, it's against job okay. creation. Fair yeah. enough. Lower, ta lower taxes, let uh, people keep more of their money so they can create more opportunities. Uh, government doesn't create jobs. People do uh, long-lasting jobs growing the private economy. Streamline the regulatory process in the state of Minnesota. Eliminate unnecessary regulation and then streamline the, uh, the regulatory process so that Minnesota becomes a one-window state for business as opposed to many windows. For instance, when you permit for water, you have to go to at least five state agencies to permit for water. Let's make Minnesota business friendly. And the third one is giving more local control. Let, uh, you said all politics are local. Uh, the best decisions when it comes to uh, responsibility, accountability are made at the local level. Well, I mean, I, I think the three... <laughs> the three things are pretty straightforward. One is that we need tax reform, not just cutting taxes down to the bone, certainly not raising taxes. I mean, Senator, to say that now you're going to allow the 10% exemption on flow through of sub S after you've just taxed small businesses an extra 30, 40% doesn't make any sense at all. So we do have to have tax reform that is going to make it possible for businesses to, to invest. Long before Representative Emmer was out with his plan, I'm the one that has been talking about making sure that small manufacturing plants can buy capital equipment purchases with an, acceler with, uh, an exemption of the, the sales tax, those kinds of things that make sense. But let's be honest, we're not going to, to start growing um, out of a, a six and now seven billion dollar shortfall on July 1 of the next fiscal year. This has to be a long-term vision. This has to be a plan that says we're in it for the long haul. We're not just in it when Democrats and Republicans decide who's in charge. Um, secondly, we do need a streamlined uh, permitting process, but that starts with the governor who's willing to say, look, there are some extraordinary circumstances. Polymet, absolutely, we ought to have a thorough investigation. But a lot of permitting, a lot of uh, permit requests that come into the, the, the government, let's have a policy that says it is the burden of the government to turn around and answer in six months. We don't need to wait 12 months, 18 months, 24 months. Turn it around in six months and get an answer or tell that business why you can't do it in six months. But the third thing we need is we need to invest in our infrastructure. And part of our infrastructure is education, part of it is roads, Part of it is high-speed broadband. I mean, I'll give you any number of examples where high-speed broadband is opening the gateway to world-class education, world-class health care in Minnesota, and world-class economic development opportunities. When you have the state making the commitment to say, we're going to invest in life sciences, in biomedical uh, diversity, in, in that kind of growth opportunity, through bonding bills that you vetoed all along, there's our future. There's the opportunity, not just for scientists, not just in the Twin Cities, but the way it can connect to the medical school at the University of Minnesota Duluth, the way it can grow life sciences jobs, good, well-paying career jobs, if you have the connection through broadband in every community in this state. That's our future. All right, we're going to start opening it up to questions. So if people would like to start lining up with the mics, we're going to go just a couple at a time. Two at a time. Just a, two at a time. Don't, you know. No elbowing, pushing, shoving? Well, you could. I mean, you get in the paper. <laughs> Chuck, people are coming down. You had another question. I, I do. Have, I, I want to ask very specifically about local government aid. Can we afford it? How? Or do we, we need to go away altogether? Or, yeah, or do we need to start weaning cities like Duluth off of it? Yeah. 
and find an alternative. Well, I, I think that, uh, I, and I've made this proposal from day one, I think local government aid needs to go back to what, was it, what it was intended to do, which is provide for essential services. Uh, local government aid was intended to provide communities that did not have the economic ability to provide the number one obligation that government needs to provide. That's for public safety, police and fire, it's sewer and water infrastructure, those things. Let's make that categorical and then let's address the uh, other funding. For instance, uh, I, I didn't look up the numbers for Duluth, but I'll give you a number for Winona. Winona sends about $40 million in local taxes to St. Paul, and you know how much it gets back? About $9 million. Uh, let's start looking at reforming that system so that our regional centers perhaps in the state of Minnesota can start to keep more of their local taxes and I'm not talking about just local option sales tax I'm talking about uh, business taxes income taxes find a, a formula that allows them to keep more of those local because again the best decisions are made at the local level well, Representative Emory in your Last year's uh, Politics of Minnesota biography, you, you were quoted as saying that you wanted to eliminate local government aids. Uh, you know, uh, that would be a, a disaster for you, Duluth. You just heard what I wanted to do. You just heard what I wanted to do. Minnesota. Well, I'm, I'm glad if you now are slightly clarifying exactly what it is you propose. I did back then, too. But, you got to um, read the whole article. Well, I did. You said you wanted to shift it from the cities to the counties because counties had, had the, the mandate. It's a goalie thing. It's, uh, <laughs> Sorry. The, uh, In northern Minnesota. I would continue local government aids because it's essential for greater Minnesota. You know, without, uh, with even the cutbacks in local government aids over the last decade, that's one of the driving forces behind the property tax increases. And property taxes is a much more regressive tax than the personal income tax. And that's one of the fundamental differences in this selection. You know, my value is that people should pay their fair share of taxes, that we should make taxes more progressive in Minnesota. Uh, Mr. Horner says he's not gonna, uh, he talks about my tax proposal. Mr. Horner, you're gonna raise taxes, you're gonna do it regressively. You're gonna extend the sales tax to clothing, to unspecified services, to consumer services, so that means, and you won't tell us what they are, but that means accounting services, legal <laughs> services, haircuts, funerals, Car repairs. I'm good I mean, those are the, the, the I got array. Those good. are the array. You're good. Of yeah, good. Really, you don't care and, about and, that. In, in, terms, of, Andy's in terms of specificity, <laughs> I, I wish you would tell us specifically what services are you going to attach a sales tax to? Because you know they talk about effects on small businesses that have to become tax collectors for the state of Minnesota. That's an, an onerous proposition. In addition to the fact that those taxes are regressive. Uh, Representative Emmer, someday you'll tell us exactly when you're going to balance the budget, and we'll have a chance to talk about your proposal as well. Actually. But the reality is that uh, there's a fundamental value difference. When, when the richest 1% of the people in the state who are making over a million dollars a year are paying only two-thirds of their income in state and local taxes as a percentage compared to everybody else, that's just not fair. That's a, that violates a fundamental, fundamental Minnesota value of fairness. I want to make taxes fairer. These two gentlemen, with all due respect, are going to make taxes more aggressive, more unfair. Well, I think the question was about local government assistance, so let me answer that question. <laughs> uh, I think we do need to keep local government uh, assistance without question. I mean, when a community like Crookston raises its taxes 1%, it collects about $4 per person. Why Zeta raises its taxes 1%, it collects $40 per person. There's the disparity. That's why we need LGA. There is the challenge, but it's also the opportunity to reform it, to refine it, to make it better. I'm also of the belief, and I've put this in my very specific plan, uh, that, that there are some things we can do with, with county aid to make it more fair, to make it more accountable. When most counties pay or charge 40% of their property taxes to pay for unfunded mandates, we can do it better than that at the county level, and I've put in a redesign program. I'll also say, Senator, you know that I'm not going to tax business to business services. That's spelled out very clearly. You know that that's not part of my plan. You know that I've put in $350 million in my plan to guard against the regressivity. We can deal with the, the sales tax in a fair way, in a way that does collect more money from those who are able to afford it while we protect the, the low income. That's right there. And Senator, you supported sales tax last time you ran for governor. Now you're opposed to it. The p good policy behind sales tax hasn't changed. The politics have. Oh, I told you, Mr. And, 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 Horner. Excuse me, just a second. Yeah. I'll finish. Mm -hmm. And Wrap Representative up, and we're go Emmer, to the Representative yeah. Emmer, just a few weeks ago, was at a, a gathering of outdoors people, and he said, "Well, I support the sales tax for, for these purposes." And so, you know, they've supported sales tax increases. What we need 
is consistency in leadership. What we need are people who are willing to put their ideas on the line and then stick to them, whether they're talking to a group of folks in northeastern Minnesota or in the Twin Cities or out at Game Fair or out at Farm Fest. The same idea for all Minnesotans. That's how we move Mr. forward. Warner, I, We're going to go over there and take questions now. Hello? Hello? <laughs> Wonderful. You're on. Um, my name is Joshua Bonilla, and I'm a Duluth citizen, hardworking Duluth citizen. Uh, my question is for Senator Dayton. Um, I read your, your Dayton deficit solution end to end, and you're, you stated that you wanted to raise taxes on those individuals, starting with those individuals making $130,000 or more, and for couples filing jointly, making $150,000 or more. Now, your plan differs from your opponent's. Can I up and do a question, please? Oh, sorry, I'll bet that. Um, sorry about that. Now, regarding the people that you stated, those making $130,000 or more, these people are the job, the job creators, the small business owners, the wealthy farm owners, legal and medical professionals. How can you ensure them through your ta that your tax cuts, or I mean, excuse me, your tax increases will not run them out of business and give them an incentive to go out of state where taxes are lower for them? Okay, good question. Excellent. Good question. Yep. Okay. Well, they clarify that what you're talking about in those uh, amounts is taxable income. That's after, I'm assuming, about a 15% standard deduction. So we're talking about actual uh, income of about $152,000 for an individual, about $173,000 for a couple filing jointly. That's about, uh, for a couple filing jointly, three times the average household income in Minnesota. And as I said before, the, the, the facts are, according to the Minnesota Department of Revenue, that the, the richest people in Minnesota, and, and more power to them, but whereas under Governor Carlson in 1994, they were paying the same percent of their income in state and local taxes as a percentage as everyone else, now they're paying, in, in those instances, about, about 80%. So I'm just asking them to go back to the, about the same tax rate that they were paying under Governor Carlson, and I'm asking them to pay the same percent of their income in state and local taxes as everyone else in Minnesota. I'm glad they're successful. But I, I think that the richest people in Minnesota both can afford to pay their fair share of taxes. And I think they're large-minded enough, if, they're a, if you're a business owner, you know that the quality of your business depends on well-educated, productive employees. That's always been the key to Minnesota's success in the business growth. It certainly was the key to my family's success. And we need a good health care system. We need highways where people can get to and from work and, and, and get goods to and from markets. So I think you know, we have to look, no, not only look at what are we asking people to pay, and I take that very seriously, asking people to pay more in taxes. I wouldn't even propose it if we weren't facing a $6 billion deficit. I didn't create that deficit, but one of us is going to have to figure out how to solve it along with the legislature in a very short period of time. And that's not going to be popular with everybody, and it's not going to be easy. But I think if we, if we don't raise revenues, the alternatives are drastic cuts, further cuts in education, drastic further cuts in health care, damaging the uh, uh, financial solvency of hospitals in Duluth and all over northeastern Minnesota and the rest of our state, continued deterioration of our highways, and, and I don't think anybody wants to live in that kind of state. Right, so I don't. Did he answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Becky, and um, I'm just a, a stay-at-home mom, hockey mom of five, and to be honest, you guys, you, all three of you are scaring the heck out of me because I don't know if anyone's paying attention, but in our nation and in this state, we, we have huge deficits um, that continue to grow, and I think a lot of us are worried that government is never the solution. It tends to be the problem quite often, and my question is, um, directed to Mr. Dayton, please, um, my question is, do you think there's enough rich in Minnesota to cover the $6 billion deficit and continue on, or should we? You remind me of my children. My children would love everything to be right in, in their world, and we need to pay for it, but you know what? We don't have the money. So I, want, I would like Mr. Dayton to define who the rich is, and, and uh, do you really think that that's going to pay the bills that, that we're facing here? Again, I, I defer to, or refer to the Minnesota Department of Revenue. And their analysis is, if the richest 10% of the people in Minnesota paid the same percent of their income 
in state and local taxes as everyone else. That would be $3.8 billion of additional revenue in the next biennium. If you made it slightly, even slightly progressive, that would be $4 billion of additional revenue in the next biennium. Again, just by asking the richest 10% of the people in Minnesota to pay the same percent of their income in state and local taxes. And you know, the, re the reason I was endorsed, for example, by the Minnesota Professional Firefighters Association, the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association, the, the Minneapolis Police Federation, is because they know that those dollars go to keep your five children safe. And they know that, the, and, and we all know, that those dollars go to provide the best possible education. If your children go to a public school or other people's children who go to public schools, who go to the University of Minnesota Duluth, the like. They go to provide essential service. Can government become more efficient? Absolutely yes. It will under Senator Yvonne Pretner Solon and my administration. Can we reduce regulations? Absolutely yes. You know, again, it's ironic that, that uh, you know, our DFL party has been the one that's not been leading state government in the executive branch for the last 20 years. And yet people are pointing the finger at state government and saying as though it's somehow our responsibility. I beg to differ. You know, I want better government. The people who are responsible now have been making it worse. Yvonne and I are going to make it better. You deserve a, a hardworking government for every tax dollar that you have, and she and I will see that you get it. Okay. You got a follow-up? Yeah, okay. All right. We got a follow-up over here, and then we'll go to Durbin. We have two straight questions on the tax of rich. I want to ask the other two candidates. Will it work? Does it work? Why or why not? No. I mean, if I thought it would work, I would have proposed the same thing. I didn't. It doesn't work. And why not? Well, it doesn't work because, first of all, you're not taxing wealth, you're taxing income. At $150,000 taxable income, you're taxing two people who already are paying $50,000 or more in federal taxes, FICA, property taxes, state taxes. They have to save for retirement. They have to save for their kids' college education. They're paying a mortgage. All the things that a person with wealth doesn't have to pay. You're taxing income, a huge difference. But beyond that, as the, the questions have suggested, you're taxing small businesses. You're taxing the job creators. Senator Dayton frequently points out, yeah, but it's only 8% of small businesses. Yeah, but it's 8% that, that are generating 90% of the small business jobs in Minnesota. When you raise their state taxes 30 to 40%, they are going to make some changes. In a lot of cases, these small businesses are ones that now get all of the flow through. They have to pay taxes on it. This is their opportunity to pay back the, the, the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. In one case I ran into at the, the state fair this week, a small business that has to pay back millions of dollars in, in investments he made, loans he took out, to get his small business to the point where it is successful. That's not how you create jobs. You do it through a fair tax that moves where the economy is. It is why a great northern Minnesota legislator, um, the, the chair of the Senate Tax Committee, Senator Bach, has said, we ought to raise the sales tax. We ought to generate revenue through the sales tax because it is the most fair way to do it. I'm the only one, I believe, who can work with a legislature that says, has a Senator Bach that says, we ought to raise the sales tax. The Republican leader, Senator Senjum, says, oh no, we ought to cut spending. You know, they're both my friends. I always agree with my friends. I'm the, I'm the one that can bring the two sides together and actually get something done instead of what we've seen up here this morning. You know what, I, uh, I, as a parent of seven children, that, uh, that formula that you've just described is a recipe for disaster. There has to be leadership in terms of leading people to where they need to be, not where they already are. I think the question that we got, the second one over here, I think it was Becky, who was talking about my kids would love to have everything. But you know what, somehow we gotta pay for it. And, and two things, first, uh, Minnesotans are better than that, Senator. I don't think Minnesotans are about uh, class warfare, attacking successful people at the expense of uh, good jobs. You talk about, both of you talk about LGA dollars. We need more LGA dollars. You know what we need? We meet, need more jobs. Can you imagine a northern Minnesota where you have growing jobs and you have higher income? then you can pay for the things you want. This is what's missing. Plus, you've got to go back and look. Every state that's tried this, for, first your numbers don't add up, and I would ask you again, you know, you've made the statement here that I just look at the Department of Revenue. You have not gone to the Department of Revenue with your plan. You have not explained to the state of Minnesota that we will have the highest income tax rate in the nation. The highest right now is Hawaii at 11. We're going to be above Hawaii, and you keep claiming we're going to be below 
or even the highest tax rate you won't go above in the, in the country. In fact, it doesn't generate the monies that you say it does. More importantly, if you look at states that have tried this type of tax policy, they actually did worse in the years after in terms of the revenues they generated for government. The only way you can solve this problem is to grow your private sector, and that means your job creators need to be allowed to keep more of their resources to reinvest in their business, start hiring again, start buying more equipment, start growing again, because the more people that are employed, the more revenues you will ultimately generate to, to pay for the services that we all have come to expect. All right, Mr. German. My name is German. Chuck, you know, as I said earlier, there's no popular way to solve a $6 billion deficit. You know, it's easy to put my plan up on the board and throw darts at it. But you got to compare mine with Mr. Horner's, which is who's going to, and I did say, Mr. Horner, earlier, that uh, these are consumer sales taxes, the consumers that the people are going to pay for, since you won't specify them, I have to you know, take what the roster is, which are such things as accounting services and legal no, services. Senator, said, we're not well, then tell, tell us, if you will tell us, Mr. Horner, if you will tell us specifically which $2.8 billion worth of sales taxes you're going to put on services, then that will remove any, any dispute or doubt. So if you'll tell us that specifically, then we'll know what, we, what we're discussing here. Representative Emmer hasn't presented us with a budget proposal. So there's nothing we can really disagree with because we don't know what it is. But I, I maintain when all three of our proposals are put in specificity, and I have asked Representative Emmer, and I will provide when I receive in the Department of Revenue their analysis of my proposal. You've then, submitted, then, you've submitted Yes, sir, I have. Then we will be able to, then we will be able to compare the three, and I think people deserve that. I think they deserve it before people start uh, early voting next week. All right, Durbin. My name is Durbin, from Minnesota Assistance Council for Veterans, and since my name was already brought up, let me make it very clear that I'm either Republican, Democrat, or Independent. My, I'm a member of the pedestrian party. I get walked on by all of you folks. <laughs> But my first thing is, is whoever is elected, we have the best commissioner of veterans affairs in the state, in the state of Minnesota, in the nation. You have the right to, to replace them. I pray, as all veterans do in this state, that you don't. Mike Puglisi is worth his weight in gold and keep him. My, major, my question is this, whether you like the past governor or current governor or not, in the last two bienniums, he's put a moratorium on cutting the veterans department and the military. We are still a country at war, and the military in this, in this state, when you're in a city that has the number one air force in the nation, the question is, will you, will you today make a commitment that you will not cut the military budget or the Department of Veterans Affairs? Yes, yes, I will. I'll take your recommendation of the commissioner very seriously and others. I want to commend Governor Plenty for his excellent appointment, the new adjutant general of the Minnesota National Guard, General Nash. And since you mentioned the Duluth Air Base, I'm very proud that one of the things I was able to do as a senator, as a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, was to help uh, get the, the funding for, to expand that base to get the next generation of the F-16 fighter planes, which when the BRAC uh, base goes in, was going through was crucial protecting uh, that base, which is also the ninth largest employer in Duluth. And I look forward to continuing to work with the Duluth Air National Guard, with the new Adjutant General, with the Commissioner of Veterans Affairs to increase support and uh, make it more effective our assistance to the courageous men and women who have served our country so very well. I will absolutely commit. I will absolutely commit to doing whatever possible can be done to uh, honor the people that have uh, not only paid the ultimate service, but those people that are currently protecting our freedoms, whether it's here or abroad. I'm the, uh, the guy who's proposed uh, eliminating taxes on retirement benefits. We need to uh, have our veterans coming home. We need them to be part of our communities, part of our business growth in the state of Minnesota. We need to honor them for the commitment that they honored us with. And thank you. Y y yes, I, I will commit to not cutting, but it goes beyond that. I'm the only one in my budget plan, again, very specific, it's at horner2010.com for those who want to take a look. I've put in new money for supportive services for, for the homeless population. I mean, I've worked with, with Commissioner Steve O'Neill and others to understand this population. One of the fastest growing populations of homeless are returning vets. 
we need to provide them with the, the, the supportive services to help them readjust, to help it reintegrate them into a sustainable, independent lifestyle. You told me about the great things that you're doing in Duluth with, with some of the supportive services, the supportive housing. That's terrific. But we need resources to do that around the state. We also need to make sure that we have a strong health care system around the state for veterans and for others. But we also need to take a look, and I think this is where the governor does have to take a, a lead. It's not just the veterans, the National Guard that in Minnesota have been deployed three, four times now. It's the families left behind. It's that working mom or dad whose spouse is, is called in for the third or fourth deployment that now has to manage as a single parent that family, has to now juggle a job. We ought to be taking care of helping those people also. I mean, as an employer, I get it. You know, sometimes it's simple things. One of the changes I made is that we took all of our time off, sick leave, vacation, holiday time, and said, employees, we're going to trust you to make good decisions with that time. We're going to call it all personal time off. You make decisions. If you have to care for a child, take the time off. If you have to care for an aging parent, take the time off. We're going to trust that you'll put in the hours. You know, as a business person, I get it. We can make those changes to help not just the veterans, but the families and spouses that also bear a significant burden from these multiple deployments. All right, over here. Good morning. I'm Paul Amaral. I have a question for Mr. Emmer Mr. Dayton. Paul, can you speak uh, up a little bit? Yes. Uh, apparently, one of the biggest questions and bones of contention has to do with the budget plan and deficit reduction. Uh, about 10 minutes ago, uh, I saw some very chummy handshaking, and I'm interested to know if that means Mr. Emmerich is going away from this meeting with a commitment to have his deficit reduction plan completed by the end of this week, and if that's done, has Mr. Dayton committed to presenting his plan to the Department of Revenue for review? Is that a commitment? Yes or no? If, if you're asking me, what I've already told you is that these guys are talking about a deficit, which frankly is what government wants to spend. And I know uh, one candidate likes to continue to say that uh, it's money the legislature spent. You know what? It's money, more revenue that the government is going to have in the next biennium. People need to start to recognize that it's not a matter of being short, it's what government wants to spend. Yes, there will be difficult decisions that need to be made, but let's start recognizing that this so-called deficit is about government wanting to spend beyond its means. It's going to have roughly $32 billion. And you know what? The plan that I put out, which is the only one so far that has been verified by the Department of Revenue that it can work, that the only one that can actually generate uh, economic growth is the one we put out yesterday. Let's start getting jobs moving. All you hear up here is about the services that we all believe we need to provide, but how are you gonna pay for those services if you are not creating good paying jobs in the state of Minnesota? I put that out yesterday. Mine has been verified, and mine is based on the fact that government is going to have more revenue to spend in the next uh, biennium. These folks are talking about a deficit because they so, want government so to grow. whole plan be out? We're going to put out a couple more pieces over the next couple weeks. So is there a final date um, when it will be out? Well, I, I, ask these guys. Are they going to put I'm, out? I'm asking you, yes. and then I'll, I'll, then I'll I, go after me. So I, when, when will yours be absolutely. out? My budget plan in terms of what we're doing was out yesterday. It's a jobs plan. Everybody here keeps talking about a deficit that frankly does not exist if you're willing to live within your means. The only way you have a budget deficit if, if you're going to be politics as usual and not be willing to look at government and say, look, we got $32 billion. This is what we're going to spend. Now let's start growing jobs again in this state so that it isn't just government that grows, so our private economy grows so you can start paying for these things. That's what we proposed yesterday. And We'll, keep well let's, be clear. One, one let's, my, be clear. let's be clear on this. All right. All right. You know, as one business uh, executive said to me, if, if you want to be a CEO, you better be able to count. And uh, Representative Emmer, you, you, what I understood when we shook hands was that as soon as my uh, pr proposal that I've submitted to the Department of Revenue, as soon as we receive that, I will make that public. Good. What I understood you to say was by this Friday, you would submit your proposal to eliminate the state deficit. I did Eliminate. it. I did it yesterday. Mr. Sir. Representative Emmer, That's what we put you out added, yesterday. You, you cut taxes by $626 million. Only a politician would say addition. leaving well, these people with that, their own just, money is a loss. You know, take, take, the private, uh, take the private econometric firm that provides this, the state budget projection. 
I mean, and, and they said, we're going to spend, you have the figure correct, $38 billion in the next biennium. You want to reduce that to $32 billion. So that means you have to cut $6 billion of what is projected to be spent Look, in the next biennium. This, so just tell us this is a great forward. Let me when, just finish, When are you guys going to start representing us, these represent people ever. instead of government? I'm just asking you. When are you going to start just, protecting I'm them? I'm asking you. I'll the fiscal integrity of Minnesota is something that absolutely needs to be protected. How about the fiscal so integrity of the us, citizens? Just tell us where you're going to cut the six billion dollars to bring the budget back down we to where going, you said. We it are needs going to, be. to live tell within us, our means, sir. If and, we didn't then change, where are you it, cut? The, theoretically, David, here's what it is: if we did not change one line item of spending over the next two years, if we agreed, and I'm not, but if we agreed that we weren't going to change a thing based on current revenue projections, the state of Minnesota after the next biennium would have a surplus, not a deficit. If we agreed we weren't going to grow government beyond where it is right now. But that's not what they're doing. What they're saying is government must grow and at whose expense? At the good people, the hardworking men and women of this state. It's time for government to live within its means and allow these people to start creating jobs again and start working. So let, let, let's be clear because Representative Emmer loves to talk about living within his means even though he wasn't willing to do it the last six years when he's been in the legislature. If you do nothing, if you do nothing, take, take Representative Lemmer at his word. Do nothing. No changes in the line item. We will have a surplus. School districts won't be paid back the $2 billion that were borrowed from them. Businesses will still be paying accelerated sales tax that the state is borrowing from them. Hospitals will still be closing because we cut GAMC and we haven't replaced it. We will have roads deteriorating. We will have roads deteriorating because that's been paid for largely by federal stimulus money. So yeah, we'll have we'll have a David, we'll have a David, wait a second. But that we'll assumes, have, wait a second, that assumes he's not growing one job. We'll have no. That I does. Do, I no. You're not growing one job, so no new revenue is what you're saying from economic growth. That's the part you're leaving out, sir. It's hard to have a discussion when these two guys keep fighting with each other and making up numbers. He's fighting with they, you now. Here, here, here's, here's the reality. Yeah, yeah. Here, here, here's the reality. We are going to grow jobs. I've got a plan out there to, to grow jobs. I'm willing to invest in the future. I think what we did through a bonding bill that Representative Emmer vetoed to invest in a whole new industry at the University of Minnesota Next door to it, a campus of <coughs> private sector businesses, venture capitalists that are going to create new jobs. You know, Representative Emmer loves to talk about the jobs we're losing to South Dakota. And we ought to be concerned about that. Absolutely. But you know where the even better jobs are going? Hudson, Wisconsin. And they're going there with the technology, with the innovation, with the ideas that are coming out of the University of Minnesota. Okay. They're going there with the talent pool that comes out of our schools. And they're going there because we haven't made the investment in incentives to keep them in Minnesota. That's the reality of our state. Right. I, I haven't seen so many poems since I was trying to pick up girls in college. <laughs> hey. yeah. Right over there. Question. <laughs> Why is Sioux Falls, South Dakota successful for all three? Oh, good question. Great question. Well, it's successful because it's decided to be a, a low tax, low cost, low service state. And, and we do need to, to keep some of those jobs here, no question about it. But we also need to compete on our talent pool. We need to compete with the, the technology that is going to make a polymet successful. We need to compete with the, the innovation that is going to make our other natural resources industry um, successful. That's the kind of, of future that we need for Minnesota. Do we need some of those, those backroom jobs that South Dakota has stolen? Absolutely. Do we need the good, well-paying career jobs that are coming out of cutting-edge industries that will be here forever, that will help provide the kinds of, of income that will, will raise a family of five or even a family of seven? Absolutely. 
It is successful because it is business friendly. It uh, has low taxes and it has a uh, streamlined regulatory process that welcomes business opportunity and allows entrepreneurs, people that understand what risk is. Government doesn't understand risk. When government uh, politicians talk about investment, they're taking your money and risking it. When you're out in the real world, you're taking your own money and you're risking it. That's the best kind of investment. They've made it a, uh, a place where they welcome that type of investment. They want you there because you can get your business started, you can get people employed, you can grow it if you are good at what you do. Uh, that's what Minnesota was known for. We still have more Fortune 500 companies in Minnesota than any other state in the union and yet they're not expanding here. We need to go and look at why. Why is because we've got a great state. There's no question. I think all three of us would agree that we've come to expect a very high quality of life in Minnesota. But you also have to understand that it's not about being bargain basement. We've got to be competitive which means we've got to reduce taxes, we've got to streamline our regulatory burdens, we've got to tell all that uh, venture capital out there and all those existing business owners, we want you here and we want you to grow here. Bring your jobs to Minnesota. As a, no corporate tax, no personal income tax, relatively high uh, property tax, again a regressive tax, falls more heavily on lower income people and senior citizens, those with fixed incomes. Uh, the, uh, the average per person income in South Dakota is about $10,000 less a year less than the average citizen in Minnesota. It ranks about 48th lowest uh, teacher salary of all the states. Uh, it, it provides a, a tax haven for some companies like uh, the bank trust companies that want to go there, but their executives don't live there. They live in Minnesota or they live in California. Uh, Wells Fargo moved there, which are, is also a, a relatively high uh, personal income tax state because of the services because they, they recognize that they're real values and that they can have better employees overall here in Minnesota or in California than South Dakota because people want to live here, because they have better public schools, better health care. And, and those are the things, if we sacrifice those, uh, and you know, if somebody really wants to pay no taxes and pay lower wages, they're gonna go, they'll go to uh, China or Cambodia. You know, it's right. education that's the future of our state and we need to reinvest in more in education. Oh, good morning. My name is Linda Riddle. I'm the Executive Director of the Domestic Abuse Intervention Programs here in Duluth. In 2008, the Minnesota Coalition for Battered Women did a survey of the costs of domestic violence. So it considered uh, services, probation, law enforcement, courts, all kinds of costs. In Duluth, in one year, the costs were $25 million. Uh, what, just considering the costs to the public, it, communities across the state, what will you do as governor, and I'd like each one of the three of you to answer this question, what will you do to end violence against women as governor? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now might be a good time to eat a cookie. Zero, <laughs> zero tolerance. Zero tolerance for abuse against women, for abuse on the basis of racial discrimination, for abuse against people who are gay, lesbian, men or women, bisexual, transgender, not in our state. You know, when a, in Rochester a decade ago when a Somali youth was beaten on his news, newspaper route, they started a program for a year long saying, not in our town. And a year long education program, zero tolerance, not in our state. And we'll get law enforcement, we'll get citizens, we'll get everyone involved, police, the prosecutors, and we'll provide the resources, you know, and, and if I'm governor, I'll put a sign back on the office wall that Rudy Perpich had said, none of us are as smart as all of us. You have more expertise than I do in terms of this area. I will rely on you and other experts to say exactly what do we need to do. But, but it's going to be with the goal that no one, no child should be abused. You know, because of, you know, we talk again about, you know, government's, a, you know, a loaded word. But there's, there's services, for example, in one of the, the, the counties in the south of here, uh, there's a triage they have because of lack of funds. If a child uh, of the age of four or above is hit with an open hand, they don't get involved because they don't have the resources. If a child three or younger is hit or hit with a, a closed fist, they do get involved. We're talking about abuse against children. We're talking about abuse against spouses and women. We're talking about abuses against people because of their identities, who they are, the God-given creation that they are. Not in our state. Not in our state.
in addition to working with people who are on the front line of the issue, you've also got to look at our educational system. I think far too often uh, our young people in our society right now are getting their understanding of how they interact with uh, people in the community through media such as TV shows that absolutely do not teach respect for uh, one another. And I, I think as we go forward, there's some uh, educational improvements that we can made, make, particularly in focusing our attention at the early childhood uh, area, the early childhood development area, the ages of uh, three and four, as we prepare kids to go into the K-12 system. Uh, I, I don't know how many people realize that uh, we really have not attacked the achievement gap in this state at all. And in fact, uh, as far as disparities between black and white children, it's incredible that Minnesota would have the greatest disparity of any state in the union. This relates uh, not only to those disparities, but the issue that you're talking about when it comes to abuse and how we treat one another. At the early childhood age, we need to have curricula that focus on preparing kids to compete when they get to K-12, but just as important, starts to teach them what respect is all about, respect for one another, and how you carry yourself with respect and how you treat others with respect. That's where it needs to happen and in the home. Well, I agree with what these two gentlemen said. I'm particularly happy to see that Representative Emmer now is endorsing early learning. I'm the only one with a budget plan. I must have got it from you. I, well, I, apparently, because it's in my budget plan. I'm the only one of the three that actually has proposed new money going into early learning because I do think it's important. I think it is an area that we need to make an investment in. And I agree with all, what, what these gentlemen said. But I also think that we have to face the reality that, that without some further investment, and there's that word again, but without some investment, we're going to continue to, to confront the, the, the problem and, and women are going to be left isolated. Uh, the, the, those with, with a, a different sexual orientation are going to be left uh, isolated. And so we do need the bullying legislation that has been proposed in the, the, the legislature. We can't afford to have communities. You know, the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities did a survey of, of its uh, communities. 40% of their members have cut basic services, including fire and police. And that was before the 2010 budget. That was before community assistance was cut deeper. That was before school districts were forced to go to four-day weeks. We can't afford that. We need a strong infrastructure. A society needs to have the infrastructure that embraces the private sector, embraces leadership from, from this kind of, of terrific nonprofit leadership, but we need a strong health care system. We need a strong education system and we need strong communities with strong public law enforcement agencies. Right, right over there. Hi, my name is Elizabeth, and um, the reality is in this state, if my child was born three weeks ago when they were full term, um, they would have full human rights that all of us have. As it stands today, if I wanted to, I could legally go and abort my child and not face any criminal prosecution. And if I couldn't pay for it, taxpayers like yourselves would be forced to pay for it. I would like to ask these gentlemen what their philosophy is on abortion and specifically what your policy is on taxpayer-funded abortion in Minnesota. Well, don't it, rush. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, look, I, 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 think, uh, I think that we all agree that we ought to reduce abortions. And so I've laid out a very specific plan that says I think we get to, to reducing abortions by making sure that all women have access to good health care, including access to, to contraceptives. I think we get there by making sure that we have responsible sex education in the schools. It was disappointing that, that Governor Pawlenty turned down the, the, the federal grant that would have expanded good, responsible, including abstinent-based sex education in, in the schools. And I think we make an investment in a, adoption services. That's what a governor can do to make good public policy to achieve the goal that I think most Minnesotans agree on, reduce the number of abortions. Well, and I, I, I don't know where the, uh, you know what, I appreciate the question, and uh, you know, Jackie and I, we believe in life, but I gotta tell you, this election, it has to be about what is hurting the state of Minnesota, the loss of jobs. It's gotta be, it, the economics are front and center. Uh, these are important issues, no doubt, 
But we got to start talking about why Minnesota is not able to do the things it might want to do. We got to talk about reforming our education system. We got to talk about reforming our government delivery systems. More importantly, we got to talk about growing jobs again in the state of Minnesota. That should be job number one for the next governor of this state, and those issues uh, will be handled by the legislature. I think the, the decision is between a woman and her doctor and her God, and I believe abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. I'm Jennifer Julesreed, and I'm commissioner of Duluth Public Utilities. And I'm wondering if you could please clearly state and, and lay out for all of us to understand clearly what your um, what your goal is for um, funding local government aid and will you continue to make bonding a priority for essential services because it's strong communities and strong businesses are built upon strong infrastructure. I, as I said earlier, I will support uh, the funds through, uh, through a progressive income tax to continue local government aids. I think they're essential and particularly in, as you get in areas uh, and this is not Duluth were areas of the state that are even uh, more rural and poorer. Uh, when I went up to Wadena and uh, the mayor there uh, showed me the devastation of the tornado, he said, you know, we're a poor community. We are, uh, one third of our citizens have a household uh, net worth of less than $15,000. We couldn't have afforded the early warning system. We couldn't have afforded the emergency response system without the assistance of local government aids. They're crucial. The bonding is also, you know, my bonding bill next year taking advantage of low interest rates would be uh, in the neighborhood of a billion dollars. Uh, Representative Ember has voted against every bonding bill, including the bonding uh, re funds for the Port of Duluth, for the expansion of Duluth Airport, the Hibbing Chisholm Airport. I believe, again, that bonding bills are job creating bills. They provide an estimated uh, $1 billion, 28,000 uh, jobs. Uh, those are, those are, that's a positive contribution that the, the state government can make to improving our economic infrastructure and also putting people to work uh, through private employers. And I would support the, that initiative and move that bonding bill next year rather than wait to 2012. You know, the, uh, I keep, it's a recurring theme up here that uh, our, our citizens don't have enough money to pay for the things that they expect, uh, not only for themselves, but the services they expect out of government. It's a recurring theme. And the only answer that's offered is, well, we need to tax more and we need to grow government more. That's what we've been doing for decades now in the state of Minnesota. That's not working. There's a reason why they don't have the money that they need to drive the services that they expect, that we expect. It's because we are not growing jobs in the private sector and it will be a recurring theme. You have got to create a business environment to grow jobs. LGA, I've answered your question uh, earlier and I'll, I'll do it again. When it comes to LGA, I believe that LGA should exist in its original intended form, which means that for essential services, police and fire, uh, essential sewer and water infrastructure, things that uh, government absolutely has an obligation to provide to all of its citizens, regardless of the economic ability of the community to provide it. And then when it comes to bonding bills, you're right. I haven't seen a bonding bill yet in the state of Minnesota while I've served in my short six years that actually met the formula, which is we should be bonding for long-term capital improvements. Uh, yeah, there's some great ones in there, Senator, when you look at it, and you would like to vote for those, but you can't pull those out and say, this fits the long-term capital improvement. that We can look at our children 20 years from now and say, this was built so that your quality of life could not only be maintained, but you'd have the opportunity for a better quality of life than we've had. Instead, we, we load it with all kinds of uh, personal things at times, personal to districts that do not meet that criteria. It is important. Uh, a bonding bill should be used, and it should be used for long-term capital investments, infrastructure that the state needs. Well, I, I mean, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. We, we, we've all, in one form or another, supported LGA, so we all support LGA. But that's not enough for, for communities around the state to grow. We do need to, to do other smart things, and I'm the only one that has laid out a specific proposal. One of the things we need to do, make sure that we have strong two-year schools, both the Botex and, and the community colleges. 
two-year schools that are fully integrated into the regional economic assets of the areas that they serve so that they're developing with the industries, the new technologies, the talent pool that is going to help those kinds of, of uh, communities grow. We need to make sure that we have lifelong training opportunities. We need to make <coughs> sure that you know, the small manufacturing uh, facilities around the state, the 10 and 12 person shops, have the resources to invest in the new technology that is going to keep them competitive, that is going to be able to add a new line. We need to make sure we have 10 ton roads that can get the, the products to market. We need to make sure that communities have the ability to build out their infrastructure. Broadband, I think that is a critical infrastructure asset. I would hope could be developed in the private sector. Sometimes it's going to be a public-private partnership. And in some communities, it's going to be a public investment and we ought to make it because that's our future. But we also can't pretend that we're going to have strong communities while we turn around and cut our health care infrastructure, for example. When we say to rural communities, we're just going to take the most vulnerable Minnesotans and dump them on your emergency rooms and expect our health care system to be strong. You know, one of the great things, look at the UMD Medical School. It has the highest percentage of medical school graduates, I believe, in the country going into rural practice. You know, that's government assistance. Right. One more question. Over there. So, yeah, if we agree that 100% of our future rests with our children, what would your administration do to put the effect on the child and their educational outcome as the priority of educational decision making? Increasingly, opportunities in education, public education, are diminishing. The arts, the humanities, athletics. Fewer and fewer students have the opportunity to make choices to participate in things that will lead to their long-term success and their productiveness as a citizen in our society. And I'd just like to know what you will do in your administration through your education reform agenda to create the child and the effect as, as on the child as the center, if you think that's important. Well, I think it's a great question, and I think it's one of the critical questions of our discussion this morning. And so, a couple of things that I've laid out. I do believe we need to invest in early childhood learning. New money. It is going to take more money, and that's the reality. 50% of our children are coming into kindergarten not fully prepared for success. That's unacceptable. We have to change that, and we can do it. Now, we can do it through some redesign. I mean, look at the, the um, sliding scale child care uh, money that, that's out there. You know, a lot of that serves the same population that we need to reach with early childhood learning. We can help merge some of that and maybe get better bang for the buck. So we can do things smarter, but we need to, to make money. Uh, we need to make good investments and use the money wisely. Secondly, my proposal is I think we ought to turn the schools back to teachers. Let teachers teach. Trust them for their instructional expertise, not just their content expertise. Allow them to recognize that this group of 30 students in front of me is very different from the group of 30 students in Hibbing, in Wyzetta, or even down the hall. Third, successful schools have great principals. We need to make an investment in, in making sure that we have the best principals, that they're trained, they go through a residency program, and that they have the, the ongoing mentoring and support. If we do that, then I think we're prepared to either go to the federal government and say we have to move away from NCLB, No Child Left Behind, or we have to change it to get rid of the rigidity. You know, so many kids learn not just by memorizing facts for a test, they learn through project-based learning, understanding how science relates to math, relates to language arts. We need to make those investments in broad, comprehensive education that includes language and the arts programs, more sciences. We ought to have more egg economy around the state. We ought to have more business courses around the state. And some of that, lastly, is going to come through some of the hybrid classes where we can open up the, the best courses, the best curriculum to students around the state um, through high-speed broadband. Uh, where they can have the, the um, uh, facilitator on site, a teacher, maybe a mid-level practitioner, but also getting the uh, course content from another site. You know, we've, uh, we have come from the one-room schoolhouse to the system that we have right now, and we've enjoyed great success in the state of Minnesota. And we still enjoy great success the world over with our students when it comes to math and science, although we have a shortage of math and science teachers. But we are falling behind in reading. 
dramatically. The, the state that should be all about reading, our, we have fallen behind, and more importantly in those other areas, other states have not only caught Minnesota, but now they've passed us. It's time to look at the delivery of the system, and we can talk about throwing more money at it, but frankly, we've got a ton of money being put in early childhood opportunities right now. They're just not focused. We've got a lot of money that's being play, paid into our K-12 system right now, but it's, it certainly is not equal. You've got uh, certain school districts that are rolling in money, and you've got others that are struggling just to provide the basic service uh, in the classroom. We got to work on putting more money in the classroom, and then you may be surprised. I, even though I don't believe the federal government should be telling the state of Minnesota how to run its schools, I'm going to give President Obama a compliment because President Obama is pushing some reforms that are desperately needed, not only in the rest of the country but here in Minnesota, including alternative teacher licensure. And I know there are a lot of teachers that are out of work right now, they've been laid off, but please understand, we do have a shortage in math and science, and if we can fill that by, by uh, creating some reforms in that alternative teacher licensure area, we should absolutely take advantage of it. The other area is we have to set measurements. Nowhere else in our society do we allow just because you showed up and just because you made it through a certain period of time. Uh, you succeed. We have to establish a goal that we expect for our students. We have to be able to put in, me in place measurements and then we've got to have a mechanism in place to report that to the parents of those children so that they know their kids are not only getting the education that, uh, that uh, we expect but getting the education that they need to compete at an international level. That's the challenge for all of us and that is not a Republican, Democrat or other issue. That's an issue that we all have to be worried about and be ready to to meet the challenge in the next four to eight years. I think it's the descriptive that uh, after an hour and a half, we finally have our first question about education and about our children and their future. You know, half of the state spending, and we call it government, goes from the state of Minnesota to our public schools. It funds <laughs> education. And I couldn't agree with more of the, the questioner said our, our, our question should be how, are, how, is, our, how is our budget, how, how, are, how are we as a state assisting our children to receive the opportunities that they need in a, in a much more challenging global economy than we've faced in the last 50 years. And I would ask is it better for our children that the state of Minnesota has reduced state funding per pupil by $1,300 in the last seven years after inflation? Is it, is it helpful to our students who cannot afford the University of Minnesota because the tuition here is one third higher than it is at the University of Wisconsin? And I think the common sense answer is no. Overcrowded classrooms, four day school weeks, elimination of, of music and, and athletics and, and other opportunities for kids to develop their, their whole being are clearly against the basic values of Minnesotans. So, so a big part of why I'm proposing to raise taxes on the richest people in Minnesota is to increase our funding for education, is to, is to pay back the shift, is to, is to increase, as I promise, state funding for K public education every year I'm governor. No excuses, no exceptions. We can't afford excuses. We can't make exceptions. We have to, we have to invest in our children. That's our future, and our future success as a state depends on it. Okay. I'm going to get in here. We're just about out of time. We're going to hear the bell ring in a minute. Dave's going to wrap it up. But one last question. In February, Duluth and St. Louis County goes, comes on down to the Capitol, and we have an event called Duluth and St. Louis County Days at the Capitol. So, gentlemen, if you're elected governor, will you attend Duluth and St. Louis County Days at the Capitol? Yes or no, Mr. Dayton? I'll, I'll attend, and you're all invited to the residence. All right. I like that. <laughs> and I'll, Yvonne and I will serve cookies. All right. <laughs> Well, that'll be good, because uh, we'll be there, too. So that's wonderful. <laughs> Not only will I attend, I'll come up here and ride the bus down with you so that we have a longer conversation. Okay, thank you very much. Let's give these gentlemen a round of applause.